Hi, I'm Bob Cornuk, and I'm going to give you information today and evidence today that will give scholars intellectual whiplash. They're not going to know how to handle this. And this video today is coming from the heart. What I'm proposing with you in this video is that we have located the correct location of Solomon's temple. We have located the correct location of Zerubbabel's and Herod's temple in the same place, which is in the city of David. We're also going to show you if the temple is indeed within the city of David, which is about 600 feet south of the traditional site with that gold iconic dome you see in Jerusalem. Every shot of Jerusalem has that gold dome. 600 feet south of there is the location of the Gion Springs. And that location is talked about as by historians as being the correct location of where the temple should be. Then if we take the temple and we go down 600 feet to the south, then we have a new pin in the ground. And with that new pin in the ground, we go and we can find other lost locations mentioned in the Bible. For instance, where was Christ crucified? He was crucified east of the temple. That's where the centurion was when he saw the temple curtain split on the east side of the temple. So we have to go east of there, 600 feet or so across the Kidron Valley. And there's a hill there. It's the lower portion of the Mount of Olives. And within the cluster of homes there is hidden from view the location of the split open tombs mentioned in scripture when Christ was crucified. We're also gonna talk about the first international church, the first church that people went to from around the world. Talked about Eusebius that says, all people from around the world came and gathered there. The only time this is possible is from about 285, 287 when the Romans left and the Diocletian revolt, which is, you know, just a couple decades after that. So we have this sliver of time where it was free to build the first church. And hidden within the cave, and Eusebius called it a, a, a cave church, has been found. So now please come with me on this journey of discovery of we believe where Christ was crucified, where, where the, uh, the temple's located, where even the first international church talked about Eusebius in the fourth century. All these are new, startling discoveries. So let's raise the Bible and use it as a candle as we go forth into the dim, murky recesses of history where discovery awaits us. I come from a police background. I'm a former policeman. I was a crime scene investigator. I was an FBI Homicide Institute graduate, and I used those skills in researching the Bible. How is this different than scholarship? Scholarship deals with premise plus proof. They come up with an idea, a hypothesis, and then they get everybody to agree with them. And they, get, they footnote their books with everybody that agrees with them. They get people to agree with them all over the place in papers that they write and publish. And this is their world that they live in. They stay in the safe harbor of mutual consent. What police work does is they do what's the problem and possibility. What is the problem with something? What are the possibilities? Completely opposite of what scholarship is. For instance, where is Mount Sinai? The Bible says that it's in Saudi Arabia. But people through tradition have been putting it in the Sinai Peninsula for years. Because tradition once established in the fourth century by Queen Helena, who guessed that there was Mount Sinai, it just stays, it's like a big rock that's in the road and you cannot get around this, this, this rock. You can't even crack the rock open with the word of God because these people are so stayed in their positions. So what we're gonna do uh, in this video is we're gonna break that big rock that's in a road of tradition and we're gonna explore and see evidence through police eyes, investigative eyes. Now. After I was a policeman, I met a guy named Jim Irwin, who's the eighth man to walk on the moon, first one to drive the car on the moon. Wow, what a great guy he was. And I went and looked for Noah's Ark with him and the crossing site of the Red Sea, and we worked together researching where the real Mount Sinai is. And tragically, Jim died at 61 years old, very young for an astronaut, and uh, sorely lost. And, and the family kind of came to me and said, would you take up the flag of Jim? Because he was trying to find lost locations in the Bible. And I did. And for years and years and years now, with 77 expeditions and five arrests, with just carrying a Bible in, a, in the Muslim countries, that's what I was arrested for. I've learned a lot. The first subject we're gonna talk about is where is the temple? 
Where's the temple of Solomon? And where's the temple of Zerubbabel? Where's the temple of Herod? They all had a holy pedigree and they all were laminated one on top of another. They were all built in the same area. And it's in the same area where David even brought the tent and put the Ark of the Covenant when he first went to uh, what we know today as Jerusalem. And then it was just a scabby little es escarpment of a mountain, no water up there to speak up, but there was one little place that had a gurgling stream. And this stream was, was ever flowing. And David wanted this, the Jebusites had it. And David said, I want that location. It's about 12 acres, high walls around it, like a battleship in the ocean. We had this little walled in area in this, in this sea of wilderness, with nothing there. So David took the Jebusite fortress. And so right there in the Jebusite fortress, God said, buy the threshing floor from a guy named Ornan, the Jebusite. Ornan said, hey, man, you can have it, dude. You, got, you can have this, this threshing floor. And so David said, no, I'm gonna buy it. And he did buy it. Why did God have David buy it? Because he wanted to show ownership of that one piece of real estate forever, that it was purchased freely, and that today we have that same patch of real estate in the city of David where we feel the temple was located because the temple was built over the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. Solomon's temple was in the city of David, the Jezubite fortress. I, I can't see how you can argue with 2 Chronicles 3.1. If we're going to take the Bible at face value, that's where Solomon's temple was. That's where the temple was built because that's where the gurgling water is. We have the Gion Springs right there. It's inside the Jebusite fortress along with the threshing floor. So we have the first uh, evidence that we have of this is the very holy precinct is that David actually brought the ark and a tent right by the Gion Springs. We know the ark was there. Why? Because you needed to have running water for the priests to wash themselves to appear before and do their priestly duties with the Ark of the Covenant. We know it's in that 12 acre area that was walled in and not way up on the Temple Mount where no water flows. They have cisterns up there today, yes. The Romans built cisterns and they had a lot of thousands of gallons of water up there, of course, but it's not living water. I've received criticism on the internet by saying there's no water up there. No, there is water up there stored in cisterns, but you need to have running water, spring water to wash the priests when they go in the temple. The only place, the only place that water flows like that is in the city of David. We're standing in the area of the city of David. Here's an archeological site, and there's the south wall of the traditional Temple Mount. So we're in the general area of the Temple Mount. And, and this area we have seen in photographs in the 1930s. And we see these terraced farms, and you can even see the people out there killing the ground. And it's very interesting that the Bible says this in a prophecy, the, pro the minor prophet Micah says in 312, Zion shall be plowed like a field, Jerusalem shall become heaps of ruins and the mountains of the temple like the bare hills of the forest. The temple is going to be like a plowed field. Well, there's no plowed field up there. Those walls have been up there, you know, a couple thousand years. If that is really the temple, Micah says that should be a plowed field. It never was. This area was. So we can be assured that in the city of David, it matches with what the prophet says and what the Bible says in history. Flavius Josephus gives us actually a guide to where this is. Josephus says, he gives a breadcrumb trail through this. He says that the, we can find the temple, he says, if you follow the ancient walls, which we know where they are, uh, in Jerusalem today, and the walls go around by the Pool of Siloam, which is in the south of the city of David, then it comes up on the east side, and when it hits the Ophel, that's where the temple is. Josephus, an eyewitness, is telling us where the temple is. That's a mic drop. You know, one of the more interesting and fun things that happened on this exploration is I wrote a book called Temple and it was out there and people were reading it and gained a lot of interest. And uh, a young lady read it and said, look, you're, you left out something very important. I said, well, I've researched this pretty hard. She goes, and she's a 14 year old young lady. And she said, well, read Psalm 46, 4. And Psalm 46, 4 says, there's a river that makes glad the city of God. And then there's a comma. And it says the holy place of the tabernacle of the temple. There's different versions of that, but most of them all say the same thing. They talk about a river, which is the only river is the Gion Springs. The city of God, many commentators believe that's referring to actually the city of David. 
We have other historians that talk about water. You know, Aristius, 300 years after Herod the Great, says there's water that gushes up from within the temple. You don't have any water up on the temple. Now here you have plenty of water that would gush in and be used for temple cleansing purposes for the priests as they do their priestly duties. So we have Tacitus talking about the temple being in the city of David. About 63 BC, the Romans took this city, General Pompey, had the gates opened up to him. And from that point on, the Romans had control here for over 300 years. The big question is, where did they stay? No one has ever found one brick that they know of that's from the Roman fortress. I believe it's because it's been on the Temple Mount. That was the Roman fortress, that huge complex. If you look at it today, it is in the same dimensions as many Roman fortresses throughout Europe. It housed the 10th Roman Legion for over 300 years in Jerusalem. There is 6,000 Legion, 4,000 support personnel. Josephus calls it the size of several cities. No one's ever found it. If Josephus says the Roman fortress was the size of several cities, then it would seem that that complex that we now call the Temple Mount would have perfectly fit the description that Josephus gives of a fort. And I think Bob Cornuke has done a little research on that to look at what Roman forts were like, and they're pretty much about the size of what we would call the Temple Mount. Now, almost comically, people have said, well, we've got to find a place of this Roman fort, so they put it northwest of what the Temple Mount is today, and they show it as this little appendage that could only handle maybe three, 400 guys. And we're talking about 6,000 Legion, 4,000 support personnel, and more with all their equipment. And so we need it to be a big area in all of the Roman forts were pretty much the size of what we see as the Temple Mount today. So as you can imagine, the critics have come out against this because we're going against one of the staid, uh, accepted locations uh, in Jerusalem, being the Temple location. It's the Western Wailing Wall where the Jews pray there, but right underneath the Western Wailing Wall, when I went in recently, I found up a, a, an inscription on side of the stones there, right by the Western Wailing Wall, in the corridor there, which would have been the entrance to the Roman fort. And it actually has a symbol of the 10th Roman Legion. And right next to that, down below, they recently found an odium, a small area where they played dice. Inside we found pottery, uh, glass vessels, uh, metal vessels, coins, etc. And even we found, after uh, sifting the soil, we found uh, almost 30 or 34 uh, uh, dice. Okay, dice. dices. Yes, 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 dice. They gambled over there. They used dice. A lot of dice has been found over there, or die. The Jews wouldn't have tolerated having them play dice right next to the wall of the temple. That was the Roman fort where they're doing this, where they're were doing their, their games of dice, throwing dice. So we have all these things that indicate that this is really the Roman fort. Physical evidence I can show you. So now we're gonna go on if the temple is indeed within the city of David. Let's go back to the city of David. And you put a pin in the ground like a surveyor does. Then everything changes to where Christ was crucified. Where the split open tombs are that's mentioned in scripture. We have a whole new area to research. If you put a pin right there in the city of David and then turn and look east, what you see is the location where Christ was crucified because the centurion saw the temple curtain split on the east side of the temple. He had to have been east of there. Now, where do people say the crucifixion sites are now? They say it's in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is west of there. It wasn't even east of the temple. Even if the temple's on the Temple Mount, it's west of there. Through this entranceway is believed to be the most holy place in the world. And this is the place where Golgotha is believed to be, where Calvary is. And as you come through these ancient doors here, you see the place where they say that Jesus, actually his body laid on this stone over here, and people pray, and they kiss it, and they worship this as a very, very holy stone. And so this is believed to be, since the fourth century, primarily by most of the world, to be the place where Jesus was crucified and was buried and was resurrected. I believe that this is not the place. We're in the northern part of the old city, and this is the Damascus Gate. 
This will lead to an area that is called Gordon's Calvary. It's the second most popular place for the crucifixion of Christ. We're going to go there now and find out if that place has the evidence to substantiate it as being the true place of the crucifixion. Gordon's Calvary, discovered in the 1880s by Charles Gordon, the famous guy from the movie Khartoum. He guessed it was there. He saw two holes in the side of a cliff and said, that looks like a skull. So I'm going to say that that's the place where Christ was crucified. Actually, the garden tomb is nothing else but a simple burial cave of first temple period, which is many hundreds of years earlier than the time of Jesus. It was used 700 years before Christ was even born, and Christ was in a fresh cut tomb that was used by, uh, gifted by uh, Joseph of Arimathea. So we have all of these conflicting things that just weave through history. And where do we get the one road? Where does, it all, where does all this bifurcation and trifurcation come together? Everything comes together here in perfect synchronicity to show us that that's the temple over there. And right above my right shoulder is the place where Jesus Christ was crucified. It comes together right at the city of David, right over the Galen Springs, right where Ornan and the Jebusite had his threshing floor. So if you turn east of there, you're gonna see where Christ was crucified because the centurion saw the temple curtain split. Well, the only place east of the city of David is the lower portion of the Mount of Olives, which is known today as the Silwan village. In history, it's a very odious place. It's been since the time of Solomon. He put up his idols there for his wives there pagan idols. So it's a place that's always had this dark, sinister presence. And today, this is where the Palestinians are, and they have a lot of guns trading and, and drug trading and all kinds of nefarious activity going on. Even the police won't even go there. It's that dark. And I think that's where Christ was crucified. So as I looked east from the city of David, going over the Silwan village, I just saw a cluster of homes that hid the whole mountainside. How could I find evidence of Christ's crucifixion there? Impossible, until I looked on the internet and I saw these amazing photographs of broken open tombs. These photographs were taken in the 1800s by Felix Bonfels and a guy named Salzman. They actually were photograph guys that, did, that made postcards for people. And what they did is they took photographs, and we have these photographs today, showing no homes there. All the homes are gone. But today it's a, just a cluster of homes. You can't see anything. I met the guy who owned a house which in those cluster of homes. He happened to be one of the leaders of the community. And we became friends talking outside, you know, over by the Garden of Gethsemane site, the, the traditional site of that. And we were talking and he said, hey, come over for tea to my house and we'll talk about it. I went and met his family. And then over the years, the years would go by and I kept coming back and saying hello to him. And he was this kindly guy that owned this property. And he said, okay, I'll show you what's behind the homes here. Uh, I'll, I'll show you. It's like lifting the curtain back for me, you know, something hidden back there. And I went behind the homes. I found all these broken open tombs that I had seen in the 1850s and 60s from Felix Bonfels and these guys. I see the tombs have split open. You can see the back part of the cavity of the tomb and the front part that was obviously in front of it, like you have a melon, one side falls off and you have the cavity of the X. This is what you have in these tombs. You can see them. You can actually go up and touch them today. This is what I believe is evidence of the crucifixion. Nowhere do you find split open tombs. This split open in the first century. And there's a flat area in front of it where the Romans would have had this area to do executions. They did a lot of executions, a lot of crucifixion. They needed a flat area to work. So right in front of these broken open tombs is this flat area. Within this jumble of tombs, we went over and we found a big cave. After five years of going to meeting with a Palestinian man, he said, let me show you something that will really blow your mind. And so I went down there and there's, he said, there's an old house in front of this. It goes back in the 1700s. No one's been allowed back here. This big cavernous area today is just filled with tires and chairs and rebar and stuff for storage. And so when I walked into this thing, the guy goes, this is this monstrous area in there where you could see where it's cut out where the 
choir loft would be, and you see things that are chiseled off the wall. I said, what's, what's on the wall? He said, those are old Christian symbols that we chiseled off because we didn't want them there. And I see areas on the walls where, where they put the candles. And I found that Eusebius talks about the very first organized church where all people from around the world came to. He called it the Mother Church. And the only time they could have done that is after the Romans left in 285, 287, and we have the Diocletian revolt, you know, a couple decades later. There was a sliver of time before Constantine went over in 325. There was a sliver of time when it's talked about Eusebius of there being what is called the first international church. In Acts, we read that people met in homes. That really was the first church, but the first constructed church for uh, mass audiences from all over the world was built right there. Eusebius says it was east of the city of God. We believe it's, it's the, the temple area. And that it's in a cave on the Mount of Olives, or on the Mount of Olives, the, the lower peak of the Mount of Olives, in a cave slash church that was built there. And we also found right next to that uh, an ancient tomb that I discovered after meeting uh, and being with Netanyahu at the Holocaust Memorial Day. It rained the night before, uh, cars were flooding down the street, and what we found there is we found another tomb. I saw a little hole in the side of a cliff. I took my, my flashlight from my phone in there and I looked in. I couldn't get in the hole, <laughs> a little bit bigger guy, so I kicked it in with my boots, made the hole big enough, wiggled in here, and voila, there's a sequence of tombs through here. This is uh, right across the Silwan Valley from the city of David. This is an example of a significant facility uh, that would have been carved out with uh, six burial chambers. This is the first century version of a mausoleum. Now, these are the classic uh, plug type plug type tombs where the body is put in and a stone is put in front of it. Yeah, and, uh, and then after the body decomposes, then they go in and take the bones and put it in ossuary. There's writing on over that one there. Yes, there is. Yes, it's Hebrew. This is exploration at its best, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <It's fun. laughs> the inscriptions were in interpreted by the IAA, the Israeli Archaeological Authority, their top guys from the Hebrew University, they concluded that it says this tomb is referencing a protest thing of where John Hyrcanus II was buried. He was the high priest and king that was killed by Herod the Great, last of the Hesmonians. So how does this all deal with prophecy or eschatology? What's going on in the future predicted by God? Well, we know one thing there has to be a temple to be rebuilt before Christ returns. Obviously, a lot of Christians are saying, well, if the temple's ever gonna be rebuilt, it's gotta be rebuilt right where the Dome of the Rock is. Wow, that's not gonna set up World War III, is it? <laughs> but if, if the real temple was in the city of David, which is to the south of where the Dome of the Rock is, significantly to the south, outside the current city walls of the city, then the temple can be rebuilt in the city of David and not touch the Dome of the Rock. That has incredible political implications, quite obviously. I'm talking to scholars and I'm talking to archeologists, and they're right now doing very expensive uh, sonar readings in the city of David. Uh, they believe that if the tent was there at the time of David and the ark was in the city of David by the Gion Springs, that could be an acceptable place to put the future temple. Not as a brick and mortar building, but as a tabernacle. You can put it up in a day. That's what they had in the wilderness, wandering in the wilderness with Moses, was a tabernacle that served as the temple. So could we see a tent be erected? And then the Antichrist goes in, declares himself God, stops temple worship, and after that is the next three and a half years of the tribulation, and we have Christ returning after that. Have to have a temple to be built first. So this is, this is extremely important in eschatology and prophecy. The other things where Christ was crucified, the, the first church where Hyrcanus was buried, all gives us clarity because they have to be east of the temple, all these things. And then if we believe the temple's in the city of David, then everything comes together like Rubik's Cube and all the colors on all each side is the same. So I hope you enjoyed this video. 
and I want to encourage you in your journey to seek God in your lives. Thank you and God bless.